welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson was recently confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Getting a justice confirmed, particularly the first black woman on the court, seems on paper to be a big win for the Biden presidency, especially when the soon-to-be Justice Jackson has better favorability ratings than any of her new colleagues at the time of their confirmations, according to a YouGov poll taken during her confirmation hearing. But Jackson was confirmed on a nearly party-line vote, I believe there were three Republicans, a sign of the polarizing times we live in. Today we're going to hear vastly different perspectives on this from voters across the political spectrum. My guest today is Dr. Ted Johnson. We're keeping it in the Bulwark family. He's a writer for the Bulwark and the director of the Fellows Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. He is also focused on the role that race plays in American politics and has recently written about Judge Jackson's identity and patriotism in the Bulwark. Welcome, Ted. It's great to have you here. What is happening? I am thrilled to be here. I'm so excited that you're here (laughs) to talk about this. I got to tell you, my producers had to talk me into doing this show. Mm. And the reason was not because I didn't want to have a complicated conversation about race. It was because I've been doing these focus groups during the Supreme Court hearings, the nomination, everything. And people do not talk about the Supreme Court. They do not care about the Supreme Court. They have not been thinking about the Supreme Court. And so I was just like, there's not going to be that much tape to work with. But it turns out, what my producers convinced me of is they pulled all the clips from multiple groups that we did, MAGA voters, swing voters, Mm -hmm. Democrats. And they were able to convince me that there was really interesting stuff for us to talk about. I know you you just told me you watched the clips twice because you're (laughs) a Navy guy who like over prepares. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Tell me what it was like watching all those focus group clips twice. It felt like I was watching a summary of cable news coverage of the confirmation. It was like I was just hearing the pundits talk about as they assess the day of events. So in that respect, it was a little disheartening because it was a parroting of the talking points already out there. But I was heartened that people were engaged. My sense of it was that beyond the Black community, that a lot of people weren't paying that much attention to this confirmation hearing. In the same way, I don't think a lot of people paid a lot of attention to Amy Coney Barrett. Kavanaugh was different because of how explosive it was. But these tend to be things that people like us think lots about and talk lots about, while the rest of America is thinking about gas prices and like, what does milk cost? So the fact that so many folks on both sides of the aisle had opinions and that they were tuned in, I took that as a positive, even if the way they had tuned in was just more disheartening. Yeah, when you say that it was like the cable news, if what you mean is that So much of what was coming back to us from all the groups was like just a reflection of the media that they consumed, like the bites that they had about it, because I think that's like exactly 100 percent right. Is that what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. It was, oh, this is Joy Reid talking or, oh, this is Tucker Carlson talking. Mm hmm. I think that reflects what we heard. But let's take them group by group. And we're going to start with the Democrats, because the Democrats were excited about Judge Jackson's confirmation, maybe not as excited as they've been around other polarizing issues, but they were happy about it. Let's listen to the Democrats. She's probably the most qualified Supreme Court nominee we've ever had. She's overqualified for the position. (laughs) The fact that that anyone is questioning her credentials is absolutely insane. She's bringing an educated perspective and watching somebody with like a home ec degree grill her was just embarrassing. She's obviously in a position where she's accumulated a incredible background of legal experience and acumen and is more than well suited for the job. Not only is she smart, but she's sharp. She's refined. I mean, she seems like a decent person, you know, and I thought back to the Kavanaugh hearings and it's like this guy is going to be on the Supreme Court. He's losing it. He can't answer questions without, you know, just coming across as just a frat boy. You know, they do like her, but Mm -hmm. what I kind of hear in their voices is almost like more of an annoyance at the way Republicans are treating her. When you watch the Democrats, did you identify with them or what did you think about the way Dems talked about her? Yeah, it felt very familiar. Talking about her qualifications, talking about her grace under fire talking about her disposition and love of country and the Mm -hmm. Constitution, it was almost like answers that were rebuttals to conservatives' view of her before, you know, they they said 
anything. You know, it was like, I know you're going to say because Biden said he was going to choose a black woman that she's not qualified. So let me tell you, she's overqualified. You know, there's probably this angry black woman trope that's going around or, or that maybe the confirmation hearing folks will try to draw that out of her. Look at her grace under fire. Yeah. Just listen, though, how our swing voters that put Biden over the top in 2020 feel about Joe Biden saying that he would nominate a black woman. So you're telling me there's no other candidate out there besides a black female who is qualified to be nominated for the Supreme Court. It doesn't make sense. So he discriminated against everyone else. I think it was setting the stage for a fight because it was the, oh, I'm going to nominate a Black female. Doesn't matter who's the most qualified. Right, right. She probably does have enough qualifications. But I just wish presidents would telegraph who they think you're going to uh, nominate ahead of time or a certain race or a group or whatever. They should just kind of keep that among their uh, administration. So this, to me, it's not about her. Per se, right. it's about Biden saying up front that he was going to nominate a black woman, right? That is what they object to. And frankly, there are lots of people at the bulwark who argued that too. And so it's not a crazy thing to say, why did he have to say that up front? What do you think about that? Because that is the framing in which they're criticizing it. Yeah, absolutely. So, two quick points on this. First is that in doing so, it directly counters the American narrative that meritocracy is the rule of the day. And we all know that this is not the kind of meritocratic society that we talk about. Uh, we, we know there's all kinds of nepotisms and other favoritisms that roll into out hirings and all kinds of decisions. So we know it's not a meritocracy, but we would like to believe that it is. And so by saying you're choosing someone from a particular demographic, you undercut the value of a meritocratic selection process. So I get that. The second part is more political strategy. And look, this is what I do. I, I study like how black people think about the world around them and how that thinking affects their voting. And let me tell you, Biden did not have to make this commitment in order to win black voters in the Democratic primary or to get black voters to show up to the polls in the primary. So it was like wasted capital. It was an unnecessary statement that actually didn't get him anything. And so I don't know if this was like off the cuff or if this is something that his pollsters were telling him, hey, you should really lean into this because it's going to make sure black voters show up for you. That wasn't the thing. Clyburn, Kamala Harris meant more to Biden's victory than the statement during the primary that he'd select a black woman. I would have preferred, and hindsight is twenty twenty. I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here. But I would have preferred he just sort of said, you know, in the NFL, they have this thing called the Rooney Rule, where every time there's a head coaching vacancy, the teams have to agree to interview at least one minority candidate. They don't have to hire him, just interview him. And I would have loved Biden to say the Biden rule will be for every vacancy I have on the Supreme Court, every position I have to fill in the cabinet or whatever, I'm going to ensure that I interview people of color, uh, women, etc., and leave it there. And so whoever he ends up choosing feels less like an affirmative action hire or a racial quota fulfillment and more like a, a rigorous selection process. Yeah. So that's really interesting because, you know, it's funny, the Monday morning quarterbacking, because I remember when he made this statement and I was kind of like, I don't know, that sounds like something a Democrat would say to me. <laughs> I don't know. And I just kind of like <laughs> let it wash over me and I didn't think that hard about it until there was this kind of active debate about it. And I, I was – nominally on the side of people who said he shouldn't have come out and said this because the thing you said first about people wanting to, A, I would like to believe in a meritocracy. I would like to believe yeah. America's a meritocracy. <laughs> I think that merit is important, the idea. And, and the thing is, it's bad for the nominee. Right. When you hear this, I mean, there's more of these quotes, but it definitely set the stage for people to be like, well, was that the best pick? Was that the most qualified exactly. person? Because instead, he just said, we're going to be, you know, taking it from this very narrow group of people. And actually, I hadn't quite thought about your point about he didn't need to do that. Because I guess there's yeah. this part of me in my analysis that I was like, well, you know, he's got to make sure as the more moderate candidate that the Democratic voting base and not even black voters, <laughs> it's actually about progressive, mm. probably more like white progressives feeling like he was <laughs> right. going to be sufficiently on their side about the kinds of people he was putting in. But 
you're just totally right that he didn't need to do it. Didn't and it. all it did was sort of cast a little doubt on her, which is unfair to her. I did love the quote from the woman in the first group of Democrats being like, she is overqualified. And I'm like, can you be overqualified for the highest court <laughs> yeah, in the land? <laughs> I'm not sure you can be overqualified. But like, I think everybody sort of agrees that she is qualified. But She's too rich to be a billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I get it. You think she is qualified. Okay. But here's the thing, though, on this point. The Democrats in the focus groups – understood, like even they weren't happy that Biden said it because they agreed with him. They thought it was a good idea, but they knew how it would be perceived by detractors. Listen to them. I think his messaging could have probably been more, I'm going to put the most well-rounded and most qualified person up. And then, yeah, you find someone like that, that he probably already had in his back pocket and knew he was going to put up there and say like, look, it's not a black or woman or white or man thing. You strip all of those qualifiers off the front of them and then present their background, their CV of experience. And it's like, yeah, this person is totally qualified for this, overly qualified. I'm happy he did it, but I think it was about the messaging. The messaging could have definitely gone a certain way where you get brownie points for it instead of it coming across as like a culture war type thing. I think he should just, I'm going to get the most qualified person. And then what you do is you leak it from other sources and say, you know, it's probably going to be a black woman. But he should never say that because it came across a little too politicky, you know, like a vote grab. So, again, that's going back to my whole messaging thing. We got to be better at this than we are. It gave the other side some ammunition to say, even though they've done the same thing. It just gave them some ammunition to say, oh, it's all about race. God, I love our focus groups when they do amateur political analysis. Like, they're just like, nope, they have strategies. They have strategies. They She should have leaked it. It's great stuff. But, I mean, I think that the Democrats agree with you. And I do think everybody's a little bit hindsight on this where I think once he picked her and she was so composed during a bunch of, like, very stupid questions mm. and was quite – and you wrote about this – you know, had this wonderful way of talking about her American experience. I think that there was this sense from people being like, oh, you should have just let her stand on her own merits. Yeah, for sure. And look, you know, the asterisk that people are putting on her name now because Biden said he was going to bring in a black woman, that asterisk was always going to be there. Maybe not as delineated as as it is now, but it was always going to be there. You know, I, I spent two decades in the military and I distinctly remember on two occasions, one after promotion to commander, one after being selected as a White House fellow, fellow officers asking me, one saying the promotion was because of affirmative action. And the other asking me, was my being black, did that play into my being selected as a White House fellow under the first black president? So the asterisks follow us, period. So if that's the case, then why bolden it? Why highlight it by making a statement like that up front? She was always going to have to have a, a bit of a hill to climb. And, and two other quick things to sort of just hammer this point home. One, Biden just nominated a woman to lead the Coast Guard. First time ever, a woman will lead a armed service. No fanfare. He didn't say, you know, when I'm president, I'm going to make sure a woman leads our armed forces. He just did it. And no one's talking about whether this woman is qualified or not, because she is. But now that quota language is absent the conversation. The other thing happening is Biden is presently naming the most diverse set of judges across the country of any president in our history, including Barack Obama. He's named more black women to the bench in his year and a half or less than year and a half than Barack Obama did in his eight years. No one's talking about it because he didn't lead with, and I'm going to make sure not just the Supreme Court has black women, but that benches across the country are filled with black people. He's just doing it. And it's not that they're unqualified, but the stigma that has followed this confirmation process isn't attached to these other nominations because he didn't signal it. He didn't lead with it. And much of the nation is just too busy with their own lives to pay attention. Okay, before we get to other clips, actually, let's dig in on this because I'm curious what you think. So what's the right thing to do in a world that is now kind of obsessed by our identities and where diversity is a big part of cultures on the left and the reaction to diversity is a big part of cultures on the right? Is the right thing to do 
just to have it be a criteria that you hold, but to not be a thing that you talk about. Because I actually think Americans would be, there's a lot of people who are like, we got to have a conversation about race. And maybe we do. Or maybe we don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're not better off by like doing things that affirm the American experiment toward a more diverse and equal society without talking about it that much. I don't know. Is that what you're saying? So there's the political strategy, which would suggest the more you talk about race, the more you're going to polarize the conversation or at least where people fall out. So whether it's right or wrong in that sense is whether it's good or bad for you politically. But there is this other element to it. Like, should we just not talk about it at all and just, you know, let diversity happen to us because we're picking qualified people and we recognize diversity is a value. It's an attribute that we should also consider as we sort of form our inner circles. But there is something about the symbolism of a thing that matters or symbolism of a person in a position and drawing attention to that kind of descriptive representation. Most of the political science around descriptive representation, and again, because I look at Black America, that's where I do most of my reading, isn't that Black folks think a Black person in office is going to suddenly put Black people first and not America first. It's that seeing a Black person in office has a value all unto itself. So there are members of the Congressional Black Caucus that voted against the Freedom to Vote Act. There are members of the Congressional Black Caucus who don't want to get rid of gerrymandering. But that doesn't mean that they are like disgraced now in the black community because they don't agree. There's something about the representation in and of itself that's of value. It has limits. Um, certainly there's a partisan line that <laughs> black Democrats get benefits that black Republicans do not get. So there is a symbolic value that I don't think we should ignore, but that doesn't mean that the symbolic value should govern political strategy, which I think the line that got blurred in this process. But here's the thing. So there's the symbolic value, which I agree, but the symbolic value just exists by like the person existing, the person being in that mm -hmm. role. There's something about when people really have, I'm just going to give you an example that I've been thinking about a lot lately, mainly because I've been watching The Dropout, which is the Elizabeth <laughs> Holmes story which I'm obsessed by. It's on Hulu. It's so good. But this is a young woman who founds this company and she is, people are excited about her because it is a tech bro environment out there in Silicon Valley. Now they got this young woman founder who's incredibly dynamic, has this great idea about how they're going to revolutionize the medical industry. And then she fails catastrophically and steals millions of dollars and has a horrible <laughs> implosion and is a total grifter and it's terrible. <laughs> When they do the little thing at the end where they're telling you where everybody wound up, they're doing like the coda. And mm. at one of it says like, and women in tech talk about how harmful it is to them as women who want to lead in the tech industry to have had this high profile incident. And I, I mm. raise this because – when you are one of the thing, right? You are mm -hmm. like you're Ellen DeGeneres. So like everything you do reflects on the entire lesbian nation, right? right. Like you're the one black person. <laughs> you're the one woman. Whenever you're that person, like you end up carrying a lot of stuff that I actually I think a lot of people mm. would love to not have to carry, right? right? And like you don't want it. You just want to be able to do your job and be in the thing. And people are like, well, but there's all this historical significance and you have to, you know, inspire other people. And people are like, do I have to though? Or like, can I just do this thing I want to do? Like, what do you <laughs> right. make of that? Yeah, no, I think it's true. And, but I think there's like a way to embrace your place in society and also remind people that just because this moment is historic does not mean I am now beholden to the history. And that I have to think in accordance with this history and I have to behave in accordance with this history. Um, let the moment be historic. Now let me go do my job. Look, Barack Obama, he showed up and said, look, I'm not the president of black America. I'm the president of the United States of America. And yet he leaned into being the first black president, you know, recognizing his life and how improbable it was with a person with his name and his skin color, et cetera, could have sent to the highest office. But then you just go be Barack and then let people hate you because they don't like the way you do drone strikes or economic policy or health care. But don't run your administration like you owe a debt to history in every decision you make. And I hope Katanji Brown Jackson does the same thing. I hope she doesn't go to every single Supreme Court case that shows up in front of her and says, what would black America want me to do? Because I know they're looking to me because I'm the standard bearer now for achievement in the judicial branch. I hope she would say, I am so thankful 
that I've had this opportunity and that I was able to make history and that people can look to me for inspiration. Now, let me go do what I'm paid to do. Let me go do what Harvard taught me to do. Let me do what my parents taught me to do, what my integrity and my ethics teach me to do, and um, not allow the history to cloud that. Hmm. Okay. Well. Easier said than done. Easier easier said than done. (laughs) Although everything that I saw from her, I watched her hearings and that's about it. But she Mm -hmm. struck me as that kind of person. And so I should note, actually, that she had the highest approval rating of, I think, anybody in the last many nominations. (laughs) You know, people. She was likable. Yeah, she was likable. People. (laughs) Although I got to say, I don't know. I have no idea what Americans really hear. Because as best I could tell from the focus groups, people are not watching the confirmation hearings. Like, they were catching the snippets. And so I think other than people listen to her and they were like, she seems fine. (laughs) Like, I don't, I can't, (laughs) she, I I heard a snippet and she sounded okay. But (laughs) there's a fundamental disconnect, I think, between the way Democrats talk about diversity and the way some of the Biden supporting swing voters did. And I do think it cuts to the heart of tensions over race in America. So let's listen to the Democrats first. I think it's excellent. It's about time that we have a woman as well as a woman of color represent our court. I mean, granted, we've been on the Supreme Court for quite some time, but I really think it was a good move. It's really going to bring some balance, I think. She's awesome. She represents so many different identities. The court and every aspect of our government should reflect the population that's being governed. We know as progressives that diversity is needed both in the executive branch and in the SCOTUS and things like that. And we all know that. All right. So the Democrats see a black woman on the Supreme Court as a good thing, but emphasizing diversity (laughs) sure sounded like it was a threatening thing to these swing voters. Listen to that. I guess in my mind, I have a son who's just coming out of college and I feel like he's getting very much discriminated against because he's not diverse. He's not the equity. He's not the inclusion. He's Mm -hmm. anti all of that. And so I, in some sense, feel like he's being discriminated against because he is a white male. So I don't know there's a good answer, right? I just feel like that there's a lot of stuff that he's being excluded from. My daughter was looking at an internship and it said, we only want minority females to apply minority females to apply to this internship for a huge company. Like, how can you do that? I've had really qualified candidates for my company who have been told they won't get another interview because they're not a minority female. They're not diverse. And it's the, okay, but at what point are we saying, like, we're no longer looking for the qualified candidate? I've never thought like one race is better than the other. And I feel like it's almost being pushed at you that it is. And to me, it's the best person for the job. It's the person best qualified for the position, whatever that position might be for office, for any job, for school, for colleges. It's just crazy to me. It it does feel like it's pushed in my face all the time. And it's like, I never even thought this way, but you all are making me feel a certain type of way because of it. And that's wrong. When you hear the swing voters, and so just keep in mind, these are people who voted for Donald Trump and then were so disgusted by Donald Trump, they voted for Joe Biden. And so I don't know how much credit to give them for that, but like they're critically thinking enough that they have changed their mind over something and they found Donald Trump's way of interacting with the world to be objectionable. (laughs) I guess to me, it's the unfortunate thing, right, is that this confirmation tended to slot into people's pre-existing feelings about Mm -hmm. affirmative action and changing demographics, which is unfortunate because then everybody can just like take a side and like a side they already have. But what did you make listening to some of these swing voters with a kind of like anxiety that they have that like, I don't know, their white kids can't get jobs. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of thoughts here. I th- you know, the one thing that immediately stood out to me was the one lady said, you know, my son, he's not diverse. He's not the equity. He's not the inclusion. And I love how diverse has now become another word for people of color or racial and ethnic minorities. Like there's white people and then there's diverse people. And diversity means white people, too. It doesn't mean like to the exclusion of white people. It it means like everyone gets to be part of this thing here. So that's one thing that stood out. I do get the anxieties because there is a sense that a focus on diversity changes the rules of the game. 
such that it overweights in, in maybe some's view the immutable aspects of your existence, like the color of your skin or your race or your ethnicity. And that feels anti-meritocratic. And so there's an immediate rejection to it. Now, we should be used to this kind of operating because for many years, like women, people of color, immigrants were like on the losing side of the status quo. And anytime it's been shaken up, whether it's women voting or immigrants being made citizens or black folks no longer being enslaved, there's a backlash like, why am I being punished for something I didn't do? Or why are the rules of the game being, sh the new rules being shoved down my throat without me being able to reject it and not be considered, you know, un-American or whatever. This is just how societies operate. So I can understand the anxieties that they're feeling are around this. And some of this, again, as there are those profiteers out there, that there's a cottage industry around, you know, DEI and anti-racism. And the more people lean into that, the more it can divide us if it's not done in a principled and, uh, you know, unifying kind of way. And it's very hard to talk about anything race in America uh, in a way that's unifying. And many have tried and uh, very, very few have succeeded, certainly in real time. You know, that's an interesting thing that you just said about diversity. You hear conservatives, uh, maybe a young <clears throat> Sarah Longwell may have been one of these people who would have. I remember being in like English class and my teacher saying reverse racism and me being like, there's no such thing as reverse racism. There's only racism against anybody like that. You can be racist against anybody. Right. I, I don't know what I, that was like a point I felt strongly about in high school. But it is weird that diversity has to be zero sum. And I guess the critical race theory conversation is like this two, where mm -hmm. it slots into this thing where people feel like, and I think with reason sometimes, that they feel like they're being told that white people are bad or when they hear diversity and they do not feel like they are included in that. Or like I hear conservatives argue, right. and, and, and I've certainly, and this is again something I would have said, what about diversity of thought, diversity right. of ideology? Mm -hmm. Because I think people do feel like that's not what people mean when they say diversity. So like, should we do a better job of explaining what diversity means? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the hard part is like, it's hard to see like one's sexual orientation more times than not just by walking in the grocery store, or it's hard to see diversity of region or ideology or like, you know, undergrad by looking at a boardroom, but racial and gender diversity, well, that's easy to see. And it's almost like, <laughs> there's a performative piece to this. Like if, if you are centering diversity, if they're like making this a priority, you want it to be evident because you want props for what you're doing. And all these other kinds of diversities are very hard to see. There's no like no marker of those kinds of diversities in the same way that there is for gender and race. So I think that's why we lean so deeply into those because there's like, a, I don't know if it's a movement is the right word, but we're not doing any panels where all the panelists are men. I've heard this over and over again, especially in the think tank space. But if like all of the men, like one's from Utah, one's from Florida and one's from New York and one's a libertarian and one's a progressive and one's a conservative. And, you know, one went to, you know, North Carolina State and one goes to Harvard and the other were from like, you might like there's like diversity there. But it, just like a panel of white men to me, you couldn't find any women that were qualified. You couldn't find any diverse people that were qualified. And so you've like gone to all these links to have a very diverse conversation about this idea and you get zero credit. So you have to layer in the physical stuff in order to sort of like get credit for, for being a diverse organization. Yeah. I guess the, the real sympathy I have with the, not so much the Trump voters, but let's say the swing voters on this is like, when I'm the only woman, sometimes I feel like they were like, oh, wait, we needed a woman for this panel. And like, yeah, uh, sure. certainly I get dropped into stuff because they're like, well, we need someone who's a Republican, but who doesn't think the election was stolen or whatever. Right. <laughs> and actually, it does make me crazy, especially on the woman thing. It does make me crazy when I feel like it's because I'm a woman that somebody like and I, I sort of I hate that. Like, I resent the notion yeah. that anybody thinks that you got something because they're like, "Ugh, we cannot have another panel. It's just men. And so I, I, I'm sympathetic that this conversation has gone wrong yeah. in all kinds of ways. And ultimately, it is to the detriment of successful – or, hey, I don't know. Maybe I'm not that successful. Maybe I'm not impressive. Maybe people are just putting me on because I'm a chick. I don't know. <laughs> but it is annoying how it, like, ultimately works against you. People think you're a diversity pick, and that's, I think, annoying to right. people. Right. And so the question is, like, is there a way we can work ourselves out of that? And again, I hate to keep bringing up the military, but it's supposed to have one of the most fair 
promotion systems of any institution in America. And if that's the case, and if people on the external to the process believe it, people internal to the process mostly believe it, then why do I get, you know, two affirmative action comments made to me, not even in the early parts of my career, like when we're supposed to be the leaders, you know, the senior officers in the military, and I get folks saying, you know, affirmative action or black guys president, no wonder you became a White House fellow. So there's no system that works us out of this. There's no process that works us out of this. This is like a culture issue we've got to tangle with. On that, though, is the solution for affirmative action to not be a thing? Like, if we just said, look, we're not doing this anymore, it is, we are going to be a meritocracy. And like, if we were saying right. that, if that was our, culturally, that was our, the way that we talked about this, would that be better? So I have like sort of the social answer where I say, well, if we look at the history of harms and how that is the history like a bad public policy, bad laws that have harmed black communities in particular, and now we're saying, okay, we're not doing that stuff anymore. There should be a period of time where you sort of help black folks recover from the centuries of harm. So I get that piece, and maybe affirmative action is one of those ways. But from the political piece, if you say, I believe in racial quotas, I believe in affirmative action, you are telling a not insignificant number of voters that race is a quality that they can never check. That's like an attribute, a resume bullet that they can never get. And that feels intrinsically like un-American. I think the better way is through socioeconomic status. And, you know, if you say folks who grew up in poverty will get points if they're the first to go to college or they'll get extra consideration for these opportunities, that isn't by race. And poverty and working class isn't as divisive as conversations about race and ethnicity are. And yet, because of the way poverty and, and those who are living check to check, the way that's sort of distributed across the country, you're going to find a disproportionate number of folks of color, diverse folks, in those categories. And so they get disproportionately helped, not because of the color of their skin, but because of their class. And that's more politically palatable, I think, than just saying straight up race-based affirmative action. You know, I've never thought about that. You should write a book. I just, I'm just oh, kidding. I, he, I've, he I've has heard it somewhere before. I'm sure. <laughs> right. so, yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> uh, we're going to switch now to another very uh, annoying cultural part of this, mm. which is that MAGA voters, they don't really like anything Biden does. So it's not a surprise. They're not thrilled with Katanji Brown Jackson. But some of their comments demonstrate how different our media ecosystems are. And it really goes to your point about the pundit point that mm. you're making. Because while a majority of Americans disapprove of the way Republican members of the Senate Judiciary Committee treated her during her confirmation hearings, these MAGA voters really absorb the GOP's talking points about her being supposedly soft on pedophiles. Let's give it a listen. You know, if a Supreme Court candidate doesn't know if she's a man or a woman or can't define that, that's pretty basic for the, you know, livelihood of civilization. He gets pedophiles lighter sentences than even the liberal prosecutors recommend. He's very easygoing on sex crimes. She feels that like people who commit sex crimes are getting a um, aren't getting a fair shake in life, and that like they should be treated with gloves or you know she's not interested in punishing them. She's more interested in helping them get better. I do give credit to Marsha Blackburn, the senator from Tennessee. Who would have thought asking her? The definition of a female would have been a gotcha question, but it really was. <laughs> so that was pretty entertaining. I guess she'd ruled in favor of like a Trump wall or something, which is great. But then this whole like pedophile thing, it's like, it's just not normal. Ted, I don't know if you've been following the whole groomer gate, uh, yeah. but uh, I've been following it quite a bit because I have some objections to these like DeSantis laws that mm. are now proliferating across the country. But two things jumped out at me. One is, whenever she got asked the question, define a woman. And like, that clearly was something that broke through to the mm -hmm. right. And I was sitting there thinking like, boy, if someone just asked me to define a woman, like, what would I say? And I don't fault her for not wanting to say, I guess, like, she didn't want to say someone with a vagina. Like, I, right. that she didn't want that to be a thing that she had to say while she was uh, uh, <laughs> With her parents sitting behind her. Like, right. <laughs> I mean, the discourse is really stupid. Um, but what do you think of that sort of being, I don't know, the, just the extent to which the culture war stuff yeah. was so much a part of her questioning? Yeah, I, so, so I knew it was coming. And I still wasn't prepared for it when it arrived. You know, a, a few things. One is that 
not answering a question is actually the norm in these confirmation hearings for a few reasons. Sometimes it's because the justices don't want to hint how they'd rule on a case that might show up before them. Others, it's because they've not thought deeply about the issue and don't want to comment on something that, again, may show up in a case, but something that they haven't considered in a legal sense. And so they, they don't want to tip their hand there. And then other times, there's just a refusal to answer or or sort of answering around the question and let letting the, the senators sort of infer what they will from it. And look, I, I think Coney Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch, they refused to answer more questions than they answered over the course of their hearing. Mm-hmm. So this is this is just how things happen here. But the pedophilia stuff, and as you mentioned, it sort of like rolls into the, sort of this grooming thing that folks are starting to worry about. These focus group folks were representative, I think, of the media that talked about these cases. And she explained it well. She's like, you know, Congress can fix this, but you guys haven't. Um, these things are advisory. And they were written before the internet made distribution of this stuff easy. So, you know, it was very difficult to produce 100 Polaroids of a child porn picture in a way that is extremely easy to do so now with computers. And so if laws are outdated, then maybe the punishment doesn't fit the crime when the punishment was written for something 30, 40 years ago. Anyway, but it's the idea that one of them said she's normalizing pedophilia. That's Mm -hmm. the takeaway from the Hawley questioning, from the reporting on this. And it's so sad because that's not what she's doing. And even I think one of them brought up, you know, she mentioned that she's a mother. And so, of course, she would object to this stuff. And she was like, well, if she was a mother. Looks like she'd want to throw the book at these folks and not go easy on them and let them off the hook. So it's no winning. There is like no rationalizing your way for them to see your side of the argument. It's just they're stuck there. And again, this is like a part of a bigger conversation the nation is having around LGBTQ, as well as like what liberals want out of America. And these folks are reacting to those perceptions. Yeah, well, this is why it annoys me, is it both somehow manages to roll into the conversation around transgender people in sports, which is a legitimate conversation that we can have. But also, it really is rolling into both the groomer conversation, which rolls into the Q conversation. This is something that uh, our colleague, J.B. Last, kind of Mm. once he made the connection for me, I kind of see it everywhere, which is Q was like the dark corner of the web thing. And like, I've never quite gotten my arms around what the Q thing is, but it has yeah, something I mean. to do with pedophilia rings. That was like Pizzagate was like they were oh, they were right, holding right. kids in the basement and that's why the guy showed right. up with the gun. Shot. And like right. Hillary Clinton, I think, is supposed to wear like baby masks on her face. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, it's all really insane. But of course, like the way that they mainstream the Q stuff is to then bring in the groomer conversation as part of the anti-LGBT bills into the transgender conversation and into this idea that somebody is soft on pedophilia, which goes to this ultimate idea that there's somehow this like elite cohort in Washington that, especially among Democrats, that is part of a pedophilia ring, I guess. Uh, And it sounds crazy to us, but you can hear it. It's like all over the way that people interpreted this conversation. Yeah, no, 100%. And, you know, my sense of it is that the reason, aside from like having to say vagina on on national TV, that Katanji Brown Jackson refused to answer that question, my sense of it is because of the Civil Rights Act and transgender athletes. Like there's almost no doubt that there's going to be a Supreme Court case in the offing, in the not, not distant future, where this is going to be challenged, whether transgender athletes can compete with the sex that they identify with and not the sex that they were born with. So if she had commented that a woman is a person with a vagina, that may have put her in a box or sullied her ability to see a case objectively when it does show up to the court. So she's thinking very like legally and strategically about this question and future court cases. And they're hearing pizza parlor pedophilia rings. There's no middle ground there. You, like, you can't have a conversation. Mm. So I think her not answering is probably it was the only thing to do. And anything else would have pushed her into a hole that would have harmed her ability to be an effective judge later. All right. So as we kind of come to a close, I want to ask you, you did most of the writing for the bulwark around Judge Jackson and even about race. Mm. And one of the things you wrote is you referred to how poorly our national conversations on race go in this country. And I just want you to listen to some of these 
comments from the focus groups because I do think that they show that race has got to be one of the hardest things to talk mm-hmm. about in America right now. I think I might feel differently than I do now if I wasn't a white female. So it's hard for me to say. I think that the affirmative action basically that's happening here is wrong when you're not going with the most qualified candidate. But also I see my perspective might be different if I wasn't white. The racism that I see here in the South on a day-to-day level boggles my mind. I mean, it just boggles my mind from somebody who was raised on the left coast. And um, I, I, I just think they turn on the TV, they saw that she's black and they're against her. I agree with you. It's ridiculous. And living in Green Bay, it's even worse because so many times if there is a person of color and they're a male of any stature, they think it's a Packer player. You know what I mean? So you can see that race is just such a polarizing thing for people to talk about. And because I did focus groups all the way through the rise of the defund the police conversation, I was focused at the time a lot on the kind of suburban women. So I was Mm. was hearing from a lot of white suburban women that, you know, they were thinking about race differently than they ever had. And they did think that what happened to George Floyd was horrible. And, you know, I felt like there was a lot of good faith grappling with race that was going on. But in our politics, I mean, you know, I would say Republicans just feel like we're talking about race too much, Democrats. Uh, I was on a a democracy panel with Charlene Eiffel, and she was very much of like, we don't talk about race enough. We're talking about it, not talking about it nearly enough. We're not having a cultural Mm -hmm. conversation, and it's at the heart of everything that happens. And Republicans just don't want to talk about it and don't think it should be that. You've said some things actually that have been interesting to me during this conversation, but how should we talk about race in America in a way that's productive? Yeah, so the national conversation we're having about race in America now is basically a bunch of focus groups of people talking to other people like them. And so for the same reason that mixed focus groups aren't productive, it's the same reason why our mixed conversations on race aren't productive. They turn into arguments, they turn into sort of who's to be blamed and who, who's the victim and um, you know, who owes who what, and it's whose fault is it? It's, and those things are not productive. Everyone just wants to win the argument and leave unscathed. Whereas in sort of the focus group where you've got a homogenous group of folks, whether it's by race or belief or ideology, whatever, they're more willing to be vulnerable, be honest, to like admit when they don't know something. It's just like, there's more grace in that space to just come as you are. And in a mixed group, everyone walks in thinking, I'm already stereotyped as like the super lefty guy or the super conservative person. And um, they come in on the defensive and not willing to extend any grace, not willing to be vulnerable and not willing to have honest conversations. And so I think that's one thing. Another is people talk about race so differently that just getting the terms right becomes the stumbling block to having any real conversation. If you walk into a room full of civil rights practitioners and say, yeah, you know, I just don't understand why the blacks don't love America. The blacks, those two words right there, the whole room will flip upside down and nothing gets done for the rest of the day. Because the blacks is not acceptable terminology when talking, especially in this kind of space. Or if you go into the wrong MAGA room and say, yeah, those insurrectionists, I don't, I thought they loved democracy. It's like insurrectionists. These were patriots or these were, um, you know, these were protests and with a few people who got out of hand or undercover Antifa or whatever. And so because we don't have a standard lexicon, because we don't have any social trust, and because we see racism as an argument to be won instead of like a conversation to be had for people to extend their understanding, it's highly unproductive in almost every way that it occurs presently. Okay, so I'm kind of obsessed with this idea that you just raised about the names for things, the terms for things, Mm -hmm. because I see this with voters and just in my life. Okay, so people want to say the right thing, right? They like want (laughs) to be decent and then they get like tripped up. And I have this objection with the left, the alphabet soup people, including, I am a part (laughs) as best I can tell of the LGBT (laughs) QAI plus community. Plus, right. And I am sometimes like, what does that letter stand for? And the right. young kids come up and they try to tell me that some new version of 
the genders has been introduced, and I'm like, well, I haven't heard about that one. Don't know what you're right. talking about, kids. <laughs> it is actually a thing that really bugs me on the left, where there is this obsession with how you talk about things, and if you don't talk about it that way, like, you are racist. Like, I don't know, Latinx. If you ask Hispanics yes, about Latinx, exactly. they'll be like, what the hell are you talking about? What are you talking about? What because white progressives mean? thought right. it up. And, like, I think that it is hard for us. How do we extend each other grace at scale, you know, it's in, in a large way because yeah. I, I see people all the time in my own life. Like people are, you know, they're trying to figure out like, like what does your kid call you? Like who's – are you mommy, mama? Like who is mm. it? And, you know, people are apologizing. I'm like, oh, black God, please don't apologize. We confuse right. it all the time. Like it's fine. <laughs> and so I just – I don't know how we find a way to extend each other more grace as we also create space for there to be – an expanding understanding of like who we all are and how we identify. Cause like, I think the transgender thing in sports is super complicated. There's a part of me as like a woman who cared a lot about women's sports and played them. And in college that, you know, in competitive sports, just to say, oh no, it's fine for someone who is biologically born a male to now compete in women's sports. There's something about that that almost feels to me like you're saying like, well, you must not care about, women's sports that much because it actually matters to us like that the competition be fair (laughs) Um, but then there's the other part of me I genuinely who was like but you know if a person has gone through the transition and they identify this way and it's like key to who they are like and sports is such an uplifting wonderful way to have a group of people so this stuff just isn't easy and it makes it so hard when you feel like you can't talk about it with anyone because you're going to get canceled or people are going to get mad at you, you're going to say the wrong thing or call somebody by the wrong name. Anyway, right. f- solve this for me, Ted. How do we scale grace? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> look, so, look um, I have thoughts on transgender athletes. I don't have the language to have conversations about the thoughts I have. Because if I walk into a room with people who think about this lots and who know – all of the letters, lots, I am immediately going to be seen as like, this is the dude that doesn't really understand the differences between the different letters. And so I just don't have those conversations with those folks. And in the places where I do have it, typically, you know, mostly black spaces, mostly black male spaces. It's, I mean, I've heard everything from, we've got the Special Olympics, why don't we have sports for transgender athletes? Like just create a separate league for them and on and on. But this language is like, it's everywhere. Like Latinx is basically saying, well, Latino is gendered and Latina is gendered. And so in order to be inclusive, let's just put an X there. There are colleges that don't have freshmen anymore. They have first years because freshmen suggest that it's a gendered first year student that is a man and not not a woman. So they call them first years. And so this is a problem. Some folks, this is like the woke mob run amok and others is like, this is inclusion that's well-intentioned, but maybe not having the results they would like. So there's that. But to this point about like grace, if we can figure out how to create social trust in a diverse society of 330 million people, then we would have discovered the American Holy Grail. Like that is the more perfect union. And it might be ultimately uncompletable. Like it it may never be attainable, but the pursuit of it is I think where the beauty of America is, and that's where like the the honor and and being an American sort of resides. But the pursuit of it means not only are you willing to be vulnerable and learn in order to be in conversation with other folks, but that they extend grace or you extend grace when other people try to do the same thing. And that is extremely difficult to do because power, personal power, individual agency feels like it's surrendered when you extend grace or when you appear vulnerable. And so that grace and vulnerability across difference is especially contentious in a hyperpartisan environment where everything is zero sum. So the fullness of the American experiment is captured in our ability to extend social trust across difference. And, uh, you know, here's to trying. Here's to trying. I love that. I <laughs> thought we were going to solve race in America on this podcast. If, if we've mm. fallen short, I apologize. But I do think that was a great discussion. I really appreciate you joining us. And thank Thank you you. all for tuning in to another episode of The Focus Group. We'll be back next week. Don't forget to go leave a rating on Apple or anywhere that you find your podcasts. Thanks, Ted. We'll see you the rest of you soon.